So what we have learned about high churn schools is that high churn schools are definitely high need schools, but not all high need schools are, are high churn schools. Something else we found out about high churn schools is that the majority of them are African American and they are low income, but not all African American, predominantly African American schools and low income schools are high churn schools. So you have to be really specific. You have to really dig deep and look at the data. So for the majority of us as first year principals, we go in gung ho looking at how do we improve student achievement? And we look at those testing grades. However, for a principal or leader of a high churn school or leader in a high churn network, we specifically have to begin looking at what? Culture and climate, attendance and mobility. And how do we address that? And it specifically impacts that P P3 literacy. Why? Because our babies in those pre-K to third grade um, grades, they're not independent in traveling to school. They are under the auspices of parents who may have to move multiple times. So many of them have attended maybe as few as two to three schools, some as high as seven to ten schools by the time they get to third grade, which heavily impacts literacy instruction. And so when you look at Chalmers, we one have probably the highest mobility rate in the district and we have the highest homeless rate in the district. So we are combating two different factors at Chalmers. So I'm in a unique role in which I am the only AUSL school within my network. So I don't have a network of principals that are in my local area that could support me with finding resources. So everything is on your own. Can you find things for yourself? Um, unfortunately, we don't have a camaraderie within the network that I'm in where people will share what they're doing for their communities. I did go in gun ho about instruction, instruction, instruction. Nah, it wasn't working, you know. So we had to do a lot of work around getting the right people on the bus. We had to do a lot of work around building a relationship with the community. We also have to make sure that we our message at Chalmers is a little different to our parents than most. My message to my parents is, let's not move your kid because of the social aspect. Because what we see is that the kids who move from school to school, academically, yeah, they might be behind, but socially, they are so far behind. They haven't built healthy relationships with other kids. They're more combative because there's just little stability. Thinking about like talent in terms of my preparedness to serve at Curtis, there wasn't not a lot vested into my preparedness of a high churn school. I came from a high churn school, but a high churn school with different needs. So the high churn school on the west side was high churn because the same groups of kids rotated in and out. But the community was stable. They were gonna leave for a year and come back to me for a year, but not, not um, a lot of new populations. Whereas in Curtis, I get new populations. I get kids that come expelled from charter schools. I'm right on the border of Indiana, so I get families that go in between for housing and things like that. So I wasn't prepared for this type of high churn school. Um, I was more prepared to come in and lead instructional change or an instructional rally. But as Romeo said, when you get those keys to the building and you're trying to lead an instructional change and an instructional rally, and you don't think about all of the issues that come with a high churn school, you end up failing that first year. When we start off at the beginning of the year, we all have our hard set and we start off with our routines and procedures and we're ready to go. Most of the high churn schools, we have multiple restarts throughout the year. And it's not talked about, we talk about it amongst ourselves, but this is something that heavily impacts our leadership as well as teaching and learning and our teacher retention. So we know in January, we're starting the school year over just like September because we have a new crop of students. So if I have to sum it up, all of what we're saying is that um, high churn schools, they affect um, the leader's ability um, to lead by affecting time, talent, and resources in the building. Um, when we talk about resources, there's always this tension amongst school leaders of high churn schools of where you allocate your resources. At this time, I want a reading interventionist, but I know I can't have a reading interventionist because I need someone who's dedicated to attendance. So I have to make the choice if I choose someone who's gonna go out and get the kids or I'm gonna choose someone that when they come in, they can spend dedicated intervention time. 
time is the most valuable thing that we have as school leaders. And as a high churn principal, you're always straddling the fence. Can I get to the classroom or do I have to go on a home visit? Can I get to the classroom or do we have an enrollment of 11 kids coming in week 35 that needs me to call policy and procedure to see if we can take the kids They haven't been in school to March? Those things affect your time and your ability to actually be an instructional leader.